Hello everyone, and thank you for coming to my lecture recital on the topic we'll be discussing today, which is intervallic improvisation on the double bass. Um, and more specifically, we're going to be talking about ways to approach playing horn and horn and other melodic repertoire on the bass using a few different contemporary and modern techniques. Um, so before we start, I was just we're just going to watch a short video of one of my idols and. This video and thoughts around it ended up being a big inspiration for a lot of the research that I've done regarding this project. So. When I was first learning how to, when I was first learning how to solo, which came much later than learning how to construct the bass line, mm -hmm. uh, I almost never listened to bass solos. Um, I, I just didn't like most bass solos. Uh, I felt that the melodic content uh, was much more comprehensive from horn players or piano players or guitar players. I found that with bass solos, particularly with jazz bass solos, I could really only understand. So I'll stop it there. That's the important part. So after I watched this video and heard this interview, um, to be honest, I felt a massive sense of relief because I hate to say it as a bass player, but I feel the same way. You know, listening to a lot of recordings, I just tend to prefer solos from other instruments. And also, unfortunately, as a bass player, I feel like a lot of other people feel the same way. Um, but this is what has inspired me and bassists like Christian McBride and many other bassists to start to explore transcribing from horn players. But the second you start doing that, you start to run into a lot of roadblocks. When you I was first to learning how to... To solos like Joel Fromm, on Scrapple from the Apple. So, I don't know if you guys know this or not, the saxophone players, they play a lot of notes. And um, I can't play that, and honestly I'd give you a thousand dollars if you could show me a bass player who could play that up to tempo, because that's insane. But obviously this is an extreme example of something that I'm getting at, which is that there are idiomatic differences between instruments. And oftentimes those differences are very difficult to overcome. So it might be, obviously this is still hard on the saxophone, but it's approachable. And something like this, is so daunting on the bass that we, a lot of us don't even know where to start. But this didn't stop me. Again, this is an extreme example, but there are plenty of other examples where I found that certain techniques can help with approaching playing something that might seem idiomatically too different to play on the bass. So, this is what has inspired me. Uh, this. <laughs> so, this is what's inspired this project. Okay, so in this presentation, there's I'll go over kind of three big things on how I think it's a great way to accomplish this task. And the first is we'll talk about some of the techniques, the contemporary techniques, which I think make it a lot easier to play intervallic passages across the bass. Okay, and there's going to be three main techniques that we'll talk about. The second thing we're going to talk about is how we can actually apply this, these techniques to different repertoire. And when I talk about repertoire, I'm specifically talking about transcriptions from horn players. So I'll have a few different horn players, transcriptions, and we'll, I'll show you how we can use these techniques. And then the last one, which I think is one of the most interesting, is how, hey Nate, grab a book. Oh, sorry, yeah, I know. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is, you know, we have a few bass players here, I'm a bass player, bass player, and we have teachers and aspiring teachers here. And I think it's important that we understand a few different ways for which we can develop these techniques both into our own playing or into our students' playing. And I'm going to go over a few different ways to do that. So first things first, let's actually talk about the techniques. So there's three main techniques that we'll talk about. Obviously, there could be many more, but for the focus of this presentation, I've focused on these three techniques. So the first one is the bridge, the second one, the two-figure fork, and the third one, the thumb one fork, which we will get into in a second. But the first one I actually want to talk about is one that we're going to talk about. And it's this idea of a thumb bridge. So, 
With these three techniques, there are all ways to play fourths across strings without needing to adjust. Okay, so bridge, two finger fork, and thumb one fork. Now the other way to do this is with a bridge with your thumb, which is the idea of pressing your thumb down on two strings. Now there are a couple issues with this technique. The first is that when you play thumb position, most of us tend to play in the middle of our thumb, so we develop a callus here, right? But if you use a thumb bridge, you have to develop a callus along your nail bed, which can be A, extremely painful, but two, it can lead to injury and nerve damage. So it's one of these things where, you know, you can really injure yourself doing it. But more importantly, I don't think you need it. In fact, I know you don't need it. Because if we learn the other two techniques, which I'm going to show you, there are plenty of ways to play fourths across the string in the upper position without using the thumb bridge, even though, you know, famous players like Edgar Meyer may utilize this technique. So, First, let's go backwards. We'll talk about the bridge, which is the way we play just a normal bridge, which is the way we play fourths across strings in the lower registers. So, this is simply, you know, a lot of the bass players, I'm sure, have done this without even realizing it, but it's just the idea of pressing down your, one of your fingers across strings. So if we have first finger across two strings, it just allows us to play across them. We can do it with three strings, we can do it with our fourth finger, is as we move up the bass, it starts to be less applicable, right? There, it's kind of iffy, but then when we, once we get into thumb position, it's completely non-existent. So, that's when we have to learn these other methods of playing fourths across strings. The first being the two-finger fork, which is just the idea of you take two of your fingers, you press them down each on one of the strings. You can also do it with your second and third, but it's more commonly done. There's two things I want you to notice about this technique. One is that we're able to adjust the interval without moving our hand shape to wider intervals. So, so all of a sudden that allows us to play not just a fourth, but others without releasing our fingers from the strings or changing our hand position. Then the second one, second thing I want you to notice is that it opens our hand position downward. So if we're playing with this bridge, or with this two finger fork, it opens, allows our thumb to move lower. So let's play it, say I'm playing a first inversion triad. It's all right there, the use of this fork. Let's stay into the strings. Okay, kind of the opposite or adjacent to this kind of fork is the thumb one fork, which is the idea of pressing your thumb on one string and one of your fingers, usually your first finger on the other. So on its own, in a vacuum, it accomplishes the same thing as the two-finger fork, but two differences. A, instead of moving to a wider interval, it can move to a shorter interval. And it opens our position upwards. So let's say we wanted to play a second inversion triad. All of a sudden we have that. I kind of lumped them all together because they're a way to play fourths across the strings. The next technique I want to talk about is the extension of thumb position. So, as the bass players in the room can probably attest, the way we generally learn the bass is we learn positions down here, and then we go to thumb position at the moment where we can't use these positions anymore. Right? So let's say we're playing the G major scale. starting the thumb position up here, we start it down here on the fourth fret. Now there's a few differences I want you to notice and a few specific advantages to you starting it down here. The first is simply the intervallic range you have on a single string without shifting. So the distance here is a whole step. I can get a minor third maybe, and then if I get the major third I have to pivot. All of a sudden that's introducing movement. Here I have a fourth. just by the change in the hand shape. And then the other thing is we all learn the bass. This is one note, this is one note, this is one note. So in one position, in normal, I have three notes. But if I'm in thumb position, 
One, two, three, four. Allows for another note without shifting. So all of a sudden, playing here, although it might not feel totally natural because most of us are used to starting from as an up here, it has very distinct advantages. Okay, now the last technique I want to talk about is the crab, which is, I like to think about it as shifting in steps. So, let's say we have a D major 7 arpeggio that we're playing in the upper register. If I were to play this without the use of the crab, the way it might look is I'd play the D, I'd play the F sharp, then I'd move my hand to shift, and play the A, and I'd play the C sharp. But the crab allows me to make this movement in steps. So I move my thumb before I release my second finger. without having to release your hands from the string and thus deadening the sound. So just a smoother transition. Okay, so those are the main techniques that I think, for at least my work, have been extremely helpful for playing intervalic passages. But the question is, is how can we actually apply them? What passages can we apply them on? And generally speaking, I've found pretty much anything. You know, if you find a passage written in this area, you can find ways to use these techniques and you can see whether they pose advantages or disadvantages. So the first thing we're going to look at is a very, very nice solo of Clifford Brown on Sand Dew. And we're first going to look at this first lick in the song because I think this lick is really interesting in the fact that it presents both reasons for and against using some of these techniques, but in the end, obviously, for it. Um, so, if I were to present this lick written out to 100 bass players, that lick in isolation, I guarantee 99 of them would either play it here, or they play it here. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that, right? That lick sounds so good right there. It's a great place. You really only need one minor shift to play it. it pretty, it's a pretty easy lick to play. But maybe we try playing it here. By utilizing a lower thumb position, right? Now, what someone might say is, well, you know, it doesn't sound as good there. And I might say, yeah, you know, obviously my E flat here is going to ring a little bit more than my E flat here. There's more string, it's just going to probably sound better. But what if I'm already on this part of the bass? What if I'm soloing over here and that lift comes up? I'm going to shift all the way back here, or am I just going to go? shift, it allows for this massive intervallic leap with no shift, just because I was more adventurous and pushed my thumb position downwards. Okay. Very, very useful. Now, the next one is perhaps like a more obvious use of this, okay, and that's just because this one has some pretty big leaps for, for us bass players, right? So, if I'm looking at this lick, and I'm playing it without using these new techniques, that one's pretty manageable. But what about this one? Okay, it's, it's a little iffy, right? That's a big, that's a big shift. I can maybe do it there. There's a couple ways to do it, but what if I just play it here? It's right there, right? It's just, it's already there. My hand position allows me to get those leaps without the need of the shift. It's kind of what I'm going on now. Now, this one is interesting because, again, it just allows us to play this lick in one position without needing to shift. So, first off, let's just look at these first four notes. Remember what I said where thumb position allows us to have four notes, where this only has three? So if I play this in normal position, I have to do a shift. If I do thumb position, it's all right there. So if I just play this, there's thumb one fork. Yeah, I know a lot of you might say, okay, but you can also play that. 
to actually assimilating it into our own vocabulary. So, first things first, let's talk about forks and bridges. And specifically a foundational exercise that I think could be very helpful for learning this technique. So, with any foundation, one, one way that always has stood the test of time is practicing scales. Right? And finding ways to practice scales with this technique. So, you'll notice that I've written some fingerings in here, but I erred on the side of not writing fingerings because I think it's important that whoever has this, whether it's you or a student of yours, that they should be exploring ways to use these techniques differently, right? Because there is no one fingering that's going to make this scale perfect. The important part is that they're practicing these techniques throughout these exercises. So if we play this first exercise, which is essentially just an A major scale in fourths, we can use the bridge in a lot of ways. So the lower register. And we can switch to 
down too. But you'll notice in that, I only use the 1 2 fork. So, what at this time, I use the thumb 1 fork in the, in the upper register. You'll notice that at first it won't work here because it's a larger interval than a fourth. So we'll have to. I see the bass player's playing on their arm. Good. Um, or maybe we do a combination. Right? Lots of different ways we can practice the technique just by combining it with scales. Okay? And of course, we can do it with scales in intervals. Jazz, classical, pop, doesn't matter. Any sort of repertoire, we see arpeggios all the time. And often with triadic, not often, but almost always with triadic arpeggios, we have fourths, right? So how can we make sure that we have the bridges and the forks within these arpeggios? What I think is interesting about this technique is you can do this on two strings, or you can do it on three strings. So let's say we take the first four. Part. 
how do we actually develop this into our own plane? Now, this is one way that I have found to be extremely useful, which is to practice these licks in context. Okay, so this is where the lick occurs on the song. So maybe what I do is I just take my iReal book, I go to JoySpring, and I loop this section. And I actually practice getting in and out of this lick in context. Right, very simple, but still slightly different. 
Now let's mess around with it some more. How about more? Right, let's turn it upside down. Right, this is just four of pretty much nearly infinitesimal ways we can mess with this lick. Okay? But again, let's practice it in context. And let's see how much we can mess around with this. So we're going to take just this four bar phrase from Beatrice and we're going to repeat it. Right? We see them all the time. 
And this one is kind of a quasi arpeggio. Um, we start on the E. So again, it's this arpeggio off the major third, creating a, sort of a diminished sound. Right, just a great way. And again, what do we see? It's a minor five to one. So this is something that's really easy to start to apply to different rep. Okay? So the first way, like we've talked about, maybe we start on different notes, or in close notes, or we can adapt it to other keys. Now I'm not going to play all these because I think we kind of get the gist of, based on the other exercises, of you know, different ways we can apply this in different keys, charting different notes, but by keeping the shape the same and by making sure we're using the crab in similar ways. Because the most important part, and the hardest part, again, is how we can develop this for our repertoire. So again, we have the same way that we are talking about before. So, we're going to practice it in context. So, first we'll play with these four bars of Drift In that we're going to hang up to.
Thank you all for coming. So many of you, thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you, of course, Dr. Sturm, for allowing me, um, for first guiding me, showing me all these techniques and hipping me and all this stuff, but also, you know, kind of setting, setting me down this path and allowing me to really explore these things. So thank you.